but let's answer one more question before I let you go. Uh, actually, I'm going to have my own question about uh, All right. That's Jesus um, basically uh, allowing um, the creation to to kill kill his uh, flesh. Well, let's explain that. Good question. Why would Jesus allow creatures to kill him? Right? You're asking me about the gospel. Beautiful mm -hmm. question. Can I explain to you? Yeah. Okay. The Bible tells us the soul that sins shall die. So if you sin, you will die. Let me show it to you. Excellent question. You're not going to see the love of Jesus. You're going to see how much Jesus loves you, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because he did something no human can do. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul who sins will die. Ezekiel 18.20, the son will not bear the iniquity of the father. Meaning, when you sin, you will face consequences before God. But that doesn't mean your father will. Meaning, if your father murdered, he's going to answer to God. But you're not going to answer for his murder. But that doesn't mean there won't be consequences. Meaning, if your father murdered someone, he'll be punished. Even before God, if he doesn't repent. But you still suffer because your father goes to jail. You lose a father and the family's broken. So you still suffer from that sin, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't get punished by God for that sin. You just suffer, right? Mm -hmm. So what the Bible is saying is, yeah, I sin. God will hold me accountable, not my daughter. But my sin will affect my daughter. Let's say I kill someone. My daughter loses her dad because I go to jail. All right. Or in the case of her mother committing adultery, destroying the marriage. Now, so what he's saying is everyone who sins will be guilty of his or her sin the son will not bear the iniquity of the father so god is not going to say hey sam you murdered i'm going to damn your daughter to hell nor will the father bear the iniquity of the son the righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself now watch here romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gracious gift of god is eternal life in christ jesus our lord so the bible talks about sin as a debt as a debt that you owe to God. So anytime you sin, you are now in debt. You have a debt to pay. As our Lord explains in Luke 11, 1 of 4. And it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we all ourselves also forgive anyone, everyone who is indebted to us. Debted, indebted, a debt. Lead us not into temptation. So the teaching of the Bible is this. I need everyone to hear this because this is a good question. When you sin, you break God's law. You now have a debt to pay. The debt of sin is death. Your sins bring about death. But God is a God of infinite love and compassion, doesn't want you to die. So if you confess and turn to God and ask forgiveness, genuinely, he forgives you. But notice, the debt still has been left unpaid, right? Here, I'll give you a very bad analogy. If you smash my car, I give you my car, and you smash it. You ask me to forgive you because you can't pay it. I do, but my car is still damaged. I must now incur the debt, correct? Mm -hmm. So even if I forgive you, the debt is still there for me to pay. If I want my car to be fixed, I got to pay for the damage you did. So there's still a debt that has to be paid even though you've been pardoned, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's take it a step further. You have a debt that's astronomical, and you have to go to court to pay the debt, and you're incapable of paying it. And the fine is <clears throat> you'll be in prison. Now, can your father who loves you pay your debt because you cannot do so in order to relieve you of that debt so you don't suffer imprisonment? Mm -hmm. He can do that, right? Yeah. That's the story of the cross. The story of the cross is humans 
are swallowed up in a debt they cannot pay. Because even when I ask for forgiveness, let's say I could pay the debt of sin. I don't stop sinning. So my debt never stops increasing. You get my point? Mm -hmm. So even if I theoretically could pay for one sin, I don't stop sinning. That means I keep sinning and my debt keeps accruing and it gets bigger and bigger. And I'm not able to stop sinning, which means my debt will never stop increasing till I die. And I don't have the means to then stop sinning and the means to pay all the debt of all the sins I've committed, correct? Mm -hmm. But let's say theoretically you had a perfect human being, one perfect human being. The Bible tells us that soul equals soul, life equals life. This is found in what's called the lax talionis, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, soul for soul, meaning a human life is equal to another human life. You get the point, right? Mm -hmm. My human life is not greater than your, your human life, correct? Mm -hmm. So even if there was a perfect human being and he wanted to pay your debt by dying in your place in love, he could only pay for one human soul because no human soul is greater in worth than all human souls collectively. It's only equal to another human soul, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, follow me, because I'm going to show you the principle. Exodus 21, 22, 25. If men struggle with each other and strike the woman with child, by the way, this shows if you cause a woman to miscarry, that child in her womb is alive, and you're guilty of murder, and you need to be put to death, showing you that abortion is murder. So that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury. She shall surely be fine, as a woman's husband will set for him. And he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall pay life for life, soul for soul. A soul equal to another soul. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, foot for foot, ah, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. You understand the principle? Mm -hmm. My life is equal to your life. My life doesn't have greater value than your life. So. Can a human soul, can a human soul pay for another human soul if he's sinful? No. Now that's one dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say if there is a perfect human soul who hasn't sinned, now he would be able to pay for how many human souls? Still just one. Exactly. Now we have a dilemma. God is a just God. He wants to forgive you and will forgive you. He doesn't want you to die. But the debt has not been paid. God's justice has not been satisfied. So the only one who has value that is infinitely greater than all creatures combined is God, correct? Mm -hmm. So God being your heavenly father and in Jesus, your savior and brother, in his love, wants to remove your debt and pay the debt but now we have another problem right mm -hmm. god is spirit by nature you're human you're not just spirit you're flesh and blood and a spirit that animates a physical body correct mm -hmm. now the sin you committed is a human sin requiring a human debt which is death if you're human and you sin the debt is you die, but you're human. That means you die a human death, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, if God wants to pay your debt, your debt is human death. How can he when he's not human? Hmm. How can he? Answer it. I think I lost you there. Uh, so you're saying... God is spirit. He's not human. If he wants to pay your debt, but you're a human being and the debt you owe is a human death. God is not man. He's spirit. How can he pay your debt? Your debt is if you sin, you die. But that's a human <laughs> death. How can God, who's spirit, pay your debt? Because your debt means a human death must take place. Mm -hmm. So how can he pay it? By becoming flesh himself.
You answered. Mm -hmm. That's the gospel. You answered it. That's the love of God. You got mm -hmm. it. You understand now? Mm -hmm. Jesus, who's God of infinite worth, <clears throat> and his love for you says, I will pay your debt because I don't want you to be in debt. I want you to be free of debt. And because I love you, I will now become human and die the human death that all humans deserve to pay the debt of all human sin. Mm -hmm. That's why. Do you understand now the gospel? Yeah. You will not find in any of the religion. But now let's take it a step further. If Jesus' death for all humanity was accepted, now why could he die and pay the debt of all humans? Because he is God. And as a divine person, his value is unlimited and infinite, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's infinite in value, he can now cover the debt of all human sin, correct? Mm -hmm. That's what he did. But if the debt was accepted, remember what the debt of sin is? Is human death. So if Christ then paid your debt, that means the debt is canceled, right? Mm -hmm. But if the debt is canceled, that means death has to be canceled, right? Correct. That's why he rose from the dead, because he could not remain dead. If his payment was accepted, that means he canceled death. And the way you know death is canceled is because you'd have to rise from the dead, conquering death, showing the debt has been accepted. And mm. hence the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Because if Jesus remained dead, then there would be no guarantee his payment was accepted, right? Right. But by rising from the dead in the flesh, rising from the dead as a man who's now glorified and his body immortal, he demonstrated the payment has been accepted. Death has been canceled, guaranteeing that at the end of the age, your bodies will be restored. You will live in a body that will never decay, die, and sin anymore. Mm. The logic of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You understand now? Yeah. But one thing <clears throat> this doesn't mean. It doesn't mean <clears throat> God punished Jesus. <clears throat> That's not what it means. Let me explain to you. It is your punishment if you don't accept Christ. But it's not punishment. God did not punish Jesus. The example again, your father and you. When the judge finds you <clears throat> and you're unable to pay the fine, you're thrown in prison and that's your punishment, right? Mm -hmm. But when your father steps in and pays the fine, he's not being punished. He is offering to pay the fine so that you can be saved from punishment. So his payment isn't punishment inflicted on him. His payment is to prevent you from experiencing punishment. Mm. So when Jesus paid your debt, isn't because he's being punished. It's here's the debt so that the debt means I die, not because I'm being punished. I'm dying in your place out of love for you so that you don't have to die because if you die, that would be punishment for you. Mm -hmm. You see the logic of the cross? Yeah. And let me give you this from scripture. Hebrews 2, 9 to 18. So excellent. Now, do you understand the gospel? Yeah, I understand it. Can you find in any other religion? No. Did Allah do what Jesus did for you? No. Did Muhammad do what Jesus did for you? No. So why would I want to follow Allah who hasn't done anything for me in comparison to what Jesus has done for me? Now here's the here's everything I told you. Here it is. Hebrews 2, 9 to 18. Here it is. Hebrews 2, 9 to 18. But we do see him, Jesus, who <clears throat> was made for a little while lower than the angels. He humbled himself to take your status, your fallen status that made you lower than the angels. Jesus, why? Why did he do it? This is pure love because of the suffering of death. He suffered death. He's now crowned with glory and honor to guarantee you will be crowned with glory and honor if you remain in him. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for who? For everyone. He died your death so you can be spared and then reign with him in glory and honor. See it? Mm -hmm. For what's fitting for him, for whom 
are all things and through whom are all things, meaning God, the Father. He made all things and all things exist through him. In bringing many sons to glory. See, God wants you to be a son and he wants to glorify you. In Islam, you're a slave. You're not a son. In Jesus, you're the son of God. Because God is your father, he wants to glorify you. It was fitting in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation. Who is the author of our salvation? Jesus. And he made him complete through sufferings. Christ had to go through sufferings to then ensure your glorification. He suffered on your behalf as payment for your debt, lovingly, not because he was being put. He accepted it gladly so you could be spared. For both he who sanctifies Jesus, who sets you apart, makes you holy, and those who are being sanctified, we who are being holy because of Christ are all of one. We all are one family. For which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers. So Jesus is saying, you're my brother, you're my sister, and you're sons and daughters of my God and Father. And this is what Jesus says about you and to you. I will recount your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. God gave you to Jesus so that Jesus could save you and glorify you and bring you home to the Father. Therefore, since the children share in what? Flesh and blood. What did he do? He himself likewise also partook of the same. Because you're flesh and blood, he became flesh and blood. That is love. Why? That through death, human death, right? Mm -hmm. He could not die human death if he didn't become flesh and blood, right? Mm -hmm. By dying, he made powerless. He rendered powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. You know what that means? Because mm -hmm. of sin, Satan had authority to accuse you before God to condemn you to die. See, he's a sinner. You're a holy God. If he sinned, you said he got to die. Well, come on, God. Show me your justice. He's got to die. And Jesus says, shut your mouth. Because now I'm going to die their death to pay their debt so that you cannot hold sin against them anymore. Mm. See what he did? Yeah. See, if you understand the Bible, the Bible says Satan is a prosecuting attorney. The Bible talks about a legal court setting. God is the judge. Satan is the prosecuting attorney. It's in Romans 8, 31 to 34. Revelation 12, 7 to 12, specifically Revelation 12, verse 10. And you'll also find it in Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 22 in Job 2, where Satan goes before God in heaven and brings accusations against people in order to move God to condemn them. It's also in Zechariah 3, verse 1 to 2. He's the prosecuting attorney. He goes before the judge and saying, wait, does your law not say if he breaks your law, he dies? Yeah. Well, he's breaking your law. Come on, God. I thought you're holy. He's got to die. And then Jesus stops him. No, I paid their debt. Their sin is removed. You have no authority. Accuse them and condemn them. This is the story of the Bible. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And notice why he died, so he can rise again to do what? And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their life. You know what that means? Hmm. You know what that means? It might free them. Inside, say it again. I was just reading it. Yeah. How does he free us from the fear of death? Because deep down inside, does anyone else, any one of us want to die? No. Deep down inside, every one of us fear what happens after death. Do I cease to exist or do I go to hell, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what Jesus did? Jesus said, I'm going to destroy your fear of death so you never have to fear dying anymore. How? Because when I die, I will rise again physically and bodily. And when I rise on the third day physically bodily, you will see I have destroyed death, the grave, and the power of Satan over your lives. And I'm giving you assurance because I live and I don't remain dead. Death is not the end of you. Death is simply a door you go through to be with me until I return and raise your bodies and unite you to your bodies. You don't have to fear death anymore because I have conquered death 
and you will not die, but live forever if you trust in me. Hmm. It's the resurrection. Because if Jesus remained dead, then we really don't have any assurance. There is life beyond death. It's something we may believe, but we don't have certainty. But because Jesus' resurrection happened in time and space, it is an historical event. Happened in history. He left the tomb empty. His body is gone because he's alive in the body in heaven. We now yeah. have assurance. When death comes looking for me, it's a door. And beyond the door, my Lord Jesus awaits to summon me into his presence. This is the gospel. Mm -hmm. And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. And I'm going to end it real quick. Therefore, right, for surely he does not give help to angels. He doesn't set angels free from death, meaning the wicked, evil angels who will be punished with everlasting destruction because the Lord doesn't come to their aid. He comes to your aid. But he gives help to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in all things. So he was truly human like us. In every sense of the word, he became truly human, suffered, tempted without sin. So they might become a merciful and faithful high priest and things pertaining to God to make propitiation, meaning to offer his life as a sacrifice to pay your debt of sin. And yet, since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he's able to come help those who are tempted. You know what that means? Hmm. Since Jesus experienced human life, human existence, <clears throat> he experienced it firsthand. He knows what it's like to get hungry, to be thirsty, to get sick, to become ill, to be hated, to be bullied, to be spit on, to be beat, to be betrayed, to be killed, because he experienced all that. And therefore, because he experienced that as a true human being, he understands your weakness and he has patience with you. Mm. Right? In other words, what you've experienced, Jesus has experienced, yet without sin. So if you've been heartbroken, Jesus was heartbroken because his best friends betrayed him and abandoned him. And he lived in a poor home and he worked day and night, hard labor with Joseph, who was a carpenter, until he began his mystery. So he's experienced human existence and he's experienced human pain and agony and misery and weakness. So when you succumb or when you are hurt or when you are weak, he doesn't rush to condemn you. He sympathizes with you and he feels your pain. Can you say that about Allah? Does, does, um, did he need to do that in order to experience that as a, as a human, as in like, say before he became flesh, well, uh, being an all, all knowing God, yeah. wouldn't he already know nope. the feelings of all those nope. things? Nope. Because Idris, you make no sense. So God knows what it's like to go to sleep. Well, if he's all, uh, nope. you don't make no sense. Listen to yourself. You're contradicting yourself. He doesn't know what it's like to go to sleep. He sees people sleep. You're confusing. Here God's still sleeping. That's one thing. I can see a person sleep, but I don't know what it's like to want sleep. You make no sense. You're contradicting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen to yourself again. It's one thing to observe people feeling pain, growing old, getting sick, and needing to sleep. It's another thing for you to experience it. For example, even as a man, do you know what it's like to take chemotherapy? No. Why not? You see it all, all the time. Mm -hmm. See, that's why I'm saying you make no sense what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Because God sees people in pain. God sees people suffering. God sees homelessness. But seeing it is not the same thing as living it. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what it's like to be beheaded? No. <laughs> but you see it. So that means according to your logic, you should know what it's like. No. Seeing and observing is not the same thing as experiencing it. Mm -hmm. So did Jesus have to do it? He didn't have to do anything. He doesn't need you. That's the beauty of the gospel.
This God who doesn't, doesn't need us, didn't need to do it, chose to do it to show you how much he loves you. You mm -hmm. understand the difference? Yeah. So did Allah do that for anybody? No. All right. So this is what I'm saying. You're confusing knowledge. That's why I say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not saying to put you. You're confusing observation. I see on video people being beheaded. But I don't know what it's like to be at, and I pray God forbid that it, I see people who've taken chemotherapy, but I don't know what it's like because I haven't experienced it. You're confusing observation, seeing, observing, and experiencing. See, Jesus can tell you, I've experienced being born. I've experienced <clears throat> needing to sleep. I've experienced being tired. I've experienced being weak. I've experienced what hunger is. I've experienced what thirst is. I've experienced toothaches. I've experienced ear aches. I've experienced falling down, you know, running and falling, or hitting my hand or hitting my head. I've experienced it. I felt it because I became man to experience it. Did you have to do it? No. Why did you do it? Because I'm in love with you. But my point is, there's a difference between observing. Here, I'll give you an example. I'm observing the bombing that's taking place in Palestine. I'm seeing dead children. I'm seeing dead people elderly. I'm seeing homes blown to smithereen, and I'm seeing people starving. But I haven't experienced it. You think mm -hmm. seeing it is the same thing as experiencing it? No. But you understand the difference with Jesus, though, right? When you go to Jesus say, do you know what it's like to be sick? Yes. Do you know what it's like to be hungry? Yes. Do you know what it's like to bust your back working long hours in cold, frost, and heat? Yes. Because when I became man, Joseph was a carpenter, a stonemason, and I'd have to start working with him since at least the age of 12, and I'd have to carry stones and wood and use hammers and nails and saws and bust my back from morning to evening six days out of the week. Of course I do. Do you know what it's like to be beaten physically? Yes. Roman soldiers pounded my face in, put a crown of thorns on my head, whipped me to the point that my back, the skin on my back, hung as shredded paper, drove huge spikes in my hands and feet, nailed me to a cross, hanging naked, gasping for air. I've experienced that. I haven't simply observed it. I experienced that. Mm -hmm. See the difference? Yeah. Has Allah done for anyone what Jesus has done for us? No. All right. That's the message of the gospel.